Hello and welcome to HLA Live. This is the third episode of HLA Live, which is our weekly program broadcast live on the HLA YouTube channel. Each week we talk to interesting people from the HLA community and beyond about the issues, face and topics that our community have expressed an interest in. We opened HLA Live with a discussion on digital health and we continued the discussion last week with the entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship journey and how to think through those ideas. This was one of three episodes I wanted to cover on the digital health, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and innovative organisations in healthcare series. This week we're going to look at innovative organisations and how to get something off the ground. This discussion will hopefully help that person that wants a full insight into taking ideas forward. They can consider and they can consider all the options before making a decision about what their future holds. The HLA has six pillars as you know by now. We deliver programs on the leader as a communicator, the leader as a manager, the leader as a negotiator, the leader as an innovator and entrepreneur, the leader as a follower and the leader as a philosopher. We build our HLA programs on these six pillars to help individuals become the best versions of themselves. Many of the episodes in HLA Live will co cover one or more of these pillars. We, want to start, we wanted to start with the leader as an innovator and entrepreneur, as there's so much focus on innovation and entrepreneurship across UK healthcare. We're really grateful to be rejoined by some of our incredible guests from the last two weeks, who have so kindly given up their time to join us for a third time uh, for the conclusion of this three episode mini series. Today's episode features Owen he Rees Hughes, Alex Kenny, Lucy Marcelo Shukla, Anas Nada, and Hassan Chowdhury, who are kindly back this week to talk about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, and that, that initial how to get those innovative organizations off the ground. As you may know from the last few weeks, Hassan is uh, the lead for digital health for Healthcare UK and one of the country's leading experts in the field. He himself has been an entrepreneur, and I'm sure his background in social care will help uh, give us uh, really interesting insights into the world of that initial first few steps. Owain is an ENT surgeon and the founder of Synapsis. For those of you here last week, you will know that Synapsis is doing incredible work across health systems, looking at the interface between primary and secondary care. Uh, given Owain's background as a practicing clinician, I'm sure he will have, uh, again, lots of interesting things that he will be able to share with us. Lucy has been innovating in the digital dent dentistry space since 2015 with the launch of two teledentistry platforms, making orthodontics and dental care more accessible and affordable through technology. And again, starting off her own organisation uh, with her co-founder, she has taken those initial steps to really uh, understand uh, what and she understands what is uh, the difficulties that many of you will face in, in this task. Um, Anas is the co-founder and CEO of Patchwork uh, Health, Patchwork Health, a digital health scale up on the mission to unleash the power of flexible working to address the global healthcare workforce crisis. Previously, he was a Darcy Fellow and a Clinical Innovation Fellow at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. And finally, Alex has founded two startups in the health and care sectors. He's building the latest startup, clinibee.com, alongside several leading NHS foundation trusts. Um, the range of speakers we've got today is, uh, is really helpful because they have got the entire gamut of some of the experiences that we want to share with you and to discuss. So without further ado, I'm going to jump straight into the conversation and welcome everyone back to join uh, to taking part and thank you all for taking the time out again on a Wednesday to to actually share your ideas and your thoughts with us. So the journey um, on uh, in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, we've talked about digital. So I'll, I'll give a background as to why uh, why we're doing it this way. But we talked about digital health and the background to digital health right now is so interesting because there's so many people doing innovative things in the space. Um, and it's creating this kind of amazing array of uh, individuals who are who have got some incredible ideas and they're sharing those ideas and they're creating this um, these uh, innovative ideas and, and, and organizations. So last week we talked about entrepreneurship that, you know, the idea of creating innovation within the wider healthcare context, the wider uh, within organizations or within the NHS or any organize any healthcare system, wherever people are watching this from around the world. But 
often in the next step, like, so someone comes up with that initial idea and it can, it doesn't have to be a, a digital or a, a, or a, a profit company or a technology company, but they've come up with that initial idea. We've talked about how they, you know, the journey they have to, to make that work. The next step is often how do you um, create something that is more sustainable? And that can be a for-profit company, such as a technology company, but it also can be, um, say, a not-for-profit or a social enterprise or a charity. And I wanted, given that we had this really, we've had this such um, colourful and interesting discussion over the last two weeks um, um, about your experiences, I'd love to kind of explore that that initial step to try and close off and help the people out there that are listening and watching this to think about that next that next step, whether it's the right step for them and what that step should be. So specifically um, around that transition in, from an idea to an organisation and what that involves. Now that organisation, we I mean, we've discussed it before we came on today. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a tech company or a tech solution or a, or a for-profit company. It could be a charity, it could be a not-for-profit. But many of those steps, I have to, I, I'm, I mean, I say this as someone who both started a tech company, a for-profit tech company, but also a not-for-profit social enterprise. Many of those steps were exactly the same, whether it was for in the tech space doing something for-profit or whether it was in the not-for-profit space really thinking through because the issues I faced were sustainability, resources, you know, wanting to have an impact, delivery, all of these ideas and the team that I was building, whether it was in both of those spaces and the, the pressures that we felt were, were, were incredibly under both, right? And so I thought that would be a really good place to have this discussion and especially with you guys, because you've got so much experience between you. So who wants to kick off with, uh, with their kind of initial reflections, views, ideas that they might have. Um, can I go first on this one then? Go on. Thanks Sorry. again for having me on HLA Live. Um, I'd like to start by saying that ideas are nothing without execution. I get lots of people telling me about their ideas and I think that's great, but that's it. That's all they have. They've not validated the idea. They've got no experience of team building. They've never managed to get anything from A to B to C to D. They've never followed through. And, and you mentioned it in your intro, Johan, you have to be able to form a sustainable organization around this. And I know people who will never come up with an idea, ever. They're no good at finance. They can't do public speaking. You'd see that in many of the skills that you'd want, they're deficient, but they can build teams, build projects, build organizations. And that's really why being a founder is one of the toughest things you can do. You need to have so many different facets, but the most important is that you can deliver, you can execute, it's not just the idea. Um, I'd like to add something to that. Um, uh, I think you, you could also start by thinking about your objectives. So if you want to start something, it could be a startup, but it could also be a different kind of company. So a startup is a company that has a disruptive, innovative business model, something that had the potential to disrupt an industry, but maybe you want to start something smaller, something um, to get some, some experience being a, an entrepreneur first before you go into building a startup that has bigger objectives. Um, and also you want to start thinking about your objectives in terms of what's your why, uh, what's important to you or not important to you. So perhaps um, there are um, sacrifices you're not ready to make uh, in your personal life or sacrifices that you, you don't make in terms of like the freedom you want um, in terms of running your company and so on. So I think it's very important to start with what do you want, what is your objective? Do you want to do this because you want to make money? Do you want to do this because you truly want to change an industry? Do you want to do this to address something to a specific audience that hasn't been addressed before? So I think that's a good starting point. And then we've discussed in the last few episodes um, starting with the problem, obviously being very important. And the second very important part to me is the audience, because if you have a problem, obviously you need an audience as well. And, and you don't need to necessarily have the idea or the solution before you have the audience. You can start building your audience before. So there are many direct-to-consumer direct to companies who do that. Um, people who already start building an audience, um, now you can do that on Instagram, for instance. And then once you have the audience, you understand that problem, you come up with a product and then your business can go much, much quicker. Um, or you can do it in a B2B uh, model where you will build your network, 
and all the people that you really need to discuss with them what their pain points are and really understand that. And once you have a strong network and you build your audience, when you come up with your product and solution, it's much, much easier. Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, sort of reiterate some of the some of the uh, previous two points, but really it's about if you have that idea is you've got to go hell for leather in terms of validating that idea and who you validate that with in terms of your internal team, as in your founding team, but also the people that you validate it with externally, you've got to work with incredibly closely. And if you don't find that really tight team, it's going to be a really difficult thing to, to execute on. And the second thing is it regardless of whether it's a private company, uh, VC funded, uh, a charity, you have to find a funding source. Otherwise, you can't execute on any of the above. <laughs> you know, you can't you can't get off the ground unless you have enough funds to start with. Um, and one bit of sage advice that I was always I was given is make sure you have enough baked beans for two years because you won't see anything for a couple of years. Um, so and I've always believed in that. And that was the same in the first startup. And it's proving proving the same in the second one. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's interesting you say about the, the 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 funding, right? I guess if you're looking at, any, I mean, you're, I think you're completely right. But in in some in many of the, but given our like many of our experiences, especially around the the tech and the the building tech, it's so there's so much resource. It's so resource intensive to build a technology solution, right? That actually, but in a in a if you're building say a charity or a social enterprise it's it's not not so much the money per se but it's the resource right it's the it's the wider resource that is so difficult to find right um and that can be difficult to find because you could i mean there's a lot of like I, I meet a lot of people that say oh well i don't need to worry about money because we're you know i'm doing it i've got volunteers i'm volunteering etc um and i guess that same is true in the in the kind of the startup space right that i often say to people are you willing to basically give up your job as you say like you know eat baked beans for the next two years because it's the same thing you're giving up a lot usually to do this i mean if you're very lucky you don't have to but um but in most cases you are and i guess the issue is is that resource you know is that resource sustainable so what happens if you're doing something in the in the charity space or the not-for-profit space you know what happens in and and this is what i challenge people with what happens in like two or three years time when you've really you've you've put your heart and soul into this thing and you've basically not um, you know you've you've just run out of steam yourself you need to get more people in and have you got a sustainability plan in that in that space right have you you know it might not be money that you need but you do need resources in order to make anything successful and it what whether you trade off one set of resources so you're not worried about the cash but you're worried about how to motivate people or how to get them to volunteer or how to get them how to get the the people you're going to have an impact on to come through the door to help you to kind of to to make your time worthwhile whatever it is you need that 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 kind of resource um that view on resources in order to make it happen so yeah i mean i guess that's that was one of the points i was going to i kind of picked up from the the early part of the discussion but one thing i wanted to ask like, and ch challenge some of you about is that is that that first step from you have this idea and you're transitioning it and knowing because obviously we're all further down that line we're looking back we've had you know you've got teams there you've got you've got uh resources you've you know you've got i mean especially in this audience you've got you know very very successful individuals who who can drive forward an idea but what about that initial first few steps what were the kind and what were those first few challenges about whether someone should make that jump should take that leap um anas Owen, do you want to tell us about Anas, you're on mute, my friend. And I just realized I'm mute. Um, it's very interesting. I think it's often um, we look probably at at our most founders look at at their first few days and weeks and months with um, with probably a sense of optimism um, and um, rose tinted glasses because I think it was quite painful um, and full of uncertainty. You look back at it, you're like, well, there was kind of there was some fun in it too, and there were some adventures. Um, I would say, you know, when it comes to the idea, at least from from my, my experience, um, 
some of the best ideas are the ideas that find you, not you find ideas. I often find, I often have um, young um, entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs who come to me asking me, what do you think the next big thing in healthcare that we need to disrupt? And I often say, well, it, it, you know, you shouldn't be looking for the idea. It often is either a lived experience, if you're a clinician in healthcare and you've lived the experience of frustration, if you're a patient and there's amazing um, startups and charities started by patients themselves who've gone through a lived experience, or it could be a witnessed experience. It's a very equally valid experience where you witnessed something in the healthcare system that you want to improve on. Um, or at least the founding team has elements of that. It doesn't have to be every co-founder who's gone through that because your co-founder can be the CTO um, who hasn't had lived experience, but you are the one who brings that in. At least from my experience, that was one of the things that really helped um, identify the early days. Um, I, I also got a bit lucky in the fact that my, whilst the idea of Patchwork started prior to me joining Chelsea Westminster Hospital as a clinical innovation fellow, together with myself, my co-founder, um, we've started thinking about it for at least a summer, the summer before that, um, and had started building the building blocks. Working as an innovation fellow at Chelsea was a great opportunity to validate with a trust and build in partnership with the trust. So we had a, 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 a healthcare organization, which would be eventually the typical buyer of our solution, our innovation, be basically part of the early stage and be an innovation partner. And I know that's not easy to replicate necessarily, but it's doable if you take the right approach. If you start building around you, as you said, your audience, but your audience don't have necessarily to be the end user. It could be large institutions who have the appetite to take the risk and co-innovate with you. That certainly helped both for us to take the confidence to make that leap and quit our jobs and give it a shot. Certainly for our investors, especially at the seed stage, to be able to invest in an untested founder at that point, um, to be able to say, well, I've got the backing of an institution that is willing to go on that journey with us. So I would always recommend that uh, where possible, try and find an innovation partner. And the last one I wanna make on that point, and I know again, probably subjective, but I'm just gonna share my experience. Where possible, get yourself a co-founder. You will need that for your own sanity. Um, and, and often the co-founder doesn't necessarily have to complement you skill set wise, because it's easy to think, well, I could be the clinical expert. I probably need someone in marketing or someone in sales or someone in tech. It doesn't matter what they do. The compliment, you want them to compliment you in personality type. So if you're the one who's always freaking out, you want someone who's calmer than you. If you're the one who's really calm, you want a meerkat who's always looking out for the risk. Um, but fundamentally, someone to lean on when things don't go well and someone to celebrate with when things do go well. Um, and I think it's hugely important to consider that. Again, maybe not for everyone, but certainly um, I'm really glad that I, I, I have a co-founder to lean on when I need to. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the co-founder issue because I think you've 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 opened you've opened a, a topic area which I really want to explore in a lot more detail. Um, but before before we go there, because um, I, I think especially with this this group, there's so much we can unpack from that whole first initial relationship issue. But the um, uh, oh, Wayne, uh, like the, the 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 that initial leap, that initial period where you go from that idea to deciding it's a, that you need some sort of wrapper around your idea, whether that's a, a, an organization a company or a charity like making that leap I think do, like apart from thinking that you need to do that for the tech purposes is there anything uh, wh wh how do you reflect back on that period where you made that decision where you know you because I'm guessing with synapsis it could have been you could almost you know have done it within an NHS organization or you could have been done in something else or wh where do you make that decision um so I think you know, somebody said that being an entrepreneur is, is controlling resources you don't own yet. Um, and so it's all about kind of how do you get people excited about your idea and how do you get people to work with you and give you resources and so on. And I think a lot of the kind of setting up a company and, and all those kind of things, they get in the way really. You know, so if, I would suggest the longer you can leave that, that, the better, really. The more work you can do validating your idea and, and you know, getting resources and, and identifying a co-founder and all those kind of things before you get into the nitty gritty of you know, sorting out your company and, you know, allocating shares and, and all those kind of stuff. It, it, it just, it can 
distract for, for a long time. So I think you should choose the kind of legal structure that fits the purpose that you, that you need. I think that, that's, 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 that's the biggest thing. Um, and, you know, a, a limited company allows you to, to get, get capital. You know, it's, it's a mechanism for, for doing that. So, um, but yeah, so I would agree with, with what you know, everybody else has said, really. I think um, you need to validate your idea as quickly as possible. So you need to, to what, one thing when you get an idea is you want to keep it to yourself because you, you're, you're worried that you're the only person in the world that's had that idea. And, you know, the, 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 whatever idea you have, chances are that lots of other people have the same idea. And in all likelihood, you know, it's going to go nowhere. That's, that's the most likely thing. Whatever idea you have, chances are it's not going to be successful and it's, it's going nowhere. So don't be afraid of telling anybody because, you know, you're, you're not going to succeed or fail based on the strength of your, of your idea. You know, the, the, the other variables are much more important. So, you know, who you're working with, how, how far you can get with the resources that you have. I think that's the key. The key skill is, is how can you, you know, leverage technology or, you know, leverage relationships, um, you know, like Amos was talking about, or, um, you know, how can you attract people who, who, who have particular skills? I think those are the most important things. Um, so you want to validate your idea as quickly as possible. So tell everybody about it and ask their opinion and, you know, seek people who don't like your idea or, you know, see the flaws in it because that, that, that will make um, a, a, a big difference, I think. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about when when's the right time to make a leap. So I, I you know, um, made a big jump when, when I absolutely had to, when, you know, when... <laughs> Um, you know, when I when we have to have to take insurance out to millions of pounds, I thought, you know, this is quite serious now. So I have to, um, I have to really focus on this now. You know, I can't, it's not fair to anyone to do it uh, with one eye open. So I thought, um, you know, it, it, at that point, it, it came absolutely necessary. Um, okay, so I, I'm I'm gonna uh, so as well as. The, so I guess the, the the point about when you make that leap is really is 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 dependent on on lots of factors. That the, the resourcing issue, um, like I know, especially in the in the startup tech space, people always focus on resources, right? They're always like they you hear people talking all the time about like raising money and and wanting to get um, they want to they they need to raise X amount of money in order to do Y or whatever, and. I think one of the things I learned in the early stages of my of, of what I've been working on over the last you know four years is that actually you don't really want resources at certain points, right? You want you the more the actually taking in resources at er, too early can be a real like like can actually start creating other problems because you then are forced to do things like set up a company and and uh, and get, take out insurance and all this stuff because suddenly you've got someone on your back essentially telling you that you need this that and the other and um, what, what we're doing where's the targets etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and I, I wanted to come to you Alex about this because actually going through it the second time I did notice with, with when you when you talked to me when we first started talking um, uh, all that time ago you mentioned about Clinibe and how you started so like you know you so um in in such a tight way and i i got the impression that that was partly because that you'd seen this experience before rather than jumping straight in and like i i get people coming to me all the time and go i'm going to raise a bunch of money and i'm not sure what the idea is but i'm raising a bunch of money because they've heard that raising money is the big the first step whereas actually you told me something completely different which is you you were going out and doing it very close and so but anyway i'll let you speak alex what do you uh, no, so I, I guess the two start the, so the first startup we built uh, we went through a series of fundraisers um that's now there's now 10 people or so um but there was a whole lot of pressures that were created because we went for funding very early and sometimes when you go for funding really early it creates quite an unnatural balance between the funder as in the investor and you as a company so because you're effectively desperate for money and they know you're desperate for money and they call it seed investing. And it's great, but you must pick the investor really, really carefully because some are, are a little more unscrupulous than, than others. And the other thing is we started it with uh, a series of founders. And, and actually one thing I was gonna say is 
Yep. Any issues you think are sort of niggling away at you right at the beginning will only amplify. They will not go away ever. They will only get more and more. So we had, you know, we had three people that were really keen to 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 start up the the my my first startup care in. And actually there was a bit of an imbalance and that only got worse as time went on. So you've got to deal with those things things really early. And so I guess that that has informed me for ClinyB in that what I'm trying to do with ClinyB is do it in a little bit more of a bootstrap way. So what I want to do is prove out a really good set or uh, a sales pipeline. If you have a really good sales pipeline and you've got a few customers that are really loyal to you, that investor conversation when you are when you inevitably want to scale up your business becomes a really adult conversation because you go to the investor and you say, we've got this sales pipeline, we've got a million in revenue every year, whatever it might be, let's have a conversation about investment. And suddenly that conversation becomes, okay, you have a proven business acumen, you have built a, a good company and we want to invest in that company for scale up reasons. And it becomes a very sort of, um, a, a slightly more equal uh, conversation in my in, in my view so the downside to that is what I'm doing is a bit it's not it's not scarier but it has higher risks I think because the funding you are you 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 need funding by your first customer so you you read with bootstrapping I think you reach a series of inflection points that are really scary so for example we got I got to a point where we were putting in this software and we we hadn't got it to to uh, an nhs foundation trust and we weren't sure whether they, they were going to pay pay for it but it got to a point where we had very little money left and we were like actually how are we going to do this and, and luckily they obviously wanted to use the product so that's fantastic but that could have been a, a going out of business situation whereas if you'd gone for seed funding that wouldn't have been so risky so there are, there's no better there's no right way it's just i wanted to, this is this is the way i decided to do it uh, this way around and i have a distinct i have a slight advantage in that i built the whole platform so so i can do it at really low cost uh, and especially in really early days that's a really high cost is building out the first bit of technology that you want to build so that it's commercially viable is expensive to, you know there's no getting away from it you have to build an exp if you're building a saas product which is what I've built then it, it it costs a lot of money to build that so, and, yeah. and and so I think that that is uh, so obviously you've we've talked about the tech part of it and I, I want to just widen that conversation out into the because the resourcing issue if you if you take the same knowledge base and apply it to any other kind of starting point for an organization is interesting because other other models require a lot less resource in terms of cash but they do require investment um Hassan and Lucy I think you both want to jump in here but Hassan do you want to go first and then yeah, so my, my story is a, a bit unusual, perhaps, that my, um, my startup I had with two co-founders and we were 100% bootstrapped to the very end. So um, I exited wow. after eight and a half years. We had friends and family loans and things like that. My two co-founders are still there doing the earn out and I decided not to do a sprint after the marathon. I thought, forget it, I'm, I'm done. So I'm, I'm currently in that phase where Alex has already passed, yeah, where you've done the first startup, where you're thinking, what should I do next? So I'm, I'm in that zone. And that's why I am not talking about ideas as passionately as I would have done a few years before. Because now if I see an idea, I, can't, I don't care. I care about the team. I care about whether those people are practical, whether they will get things done, whether I can rely on them whether we all have family issues, we all have things that hit us in our lives. You just got to bring your A game. Sometimes you do need to jump on a call on a Sunday night because your SaaS product has, has suddenly melted down and you've got to do something about it, right? At one point at Health IQ, we were running three separate businesses. Now you wouldn't know that they were three separate businesses because we never explained it as such. We had three product lines but they were all so disparate that they were three different businesses. We had a research line, we had a, a modeling, and by modeling, I, I, I mean not catwalk, mm. but someone was actually doing discrete event simulation. So for the NHS, we were modeling pathways and we were showing them the differences that they could make in real time if they switched to a different model. And these were being paid for by drug companies. So um, 
I remember we did one for sulfur broil and, and multiple sclerosis. And we had one major drug company pay for one part of the pathway and another to completely reverse it. And they, they paid us to do both versions. And when we presented that to, to Salford, they used that to make decisions. On the other side, we also had a SaaS platform. So each part of the team had its own PML. Each part of the team needed to bring in enough money to survive. And for us, resources and making the best of that meant that sometimes you had to let one product stop a little, stall a little. One customer would be told, look, can we come back to you a few days later? It was a juggling act the whole time. And I tell you what, if I had to change the idea behind the company and keep the team, I would have kept the team because the team became everything. We pivoted five times, potentially over the eight and a half years. Now they weren't major pivots, but they were pivots, right? <clears throat> and that's why I think now with the experience of having an exit, that really it's about, have you managed to get things done? And if you can, each problem that comes your way, and there'll be ones you will never have imagined, you can swallow them up. International expansion into Southeast Asia, Okay, I'll work out what that is. I've, I've managed to sell to the NHS, I'll work that out. But if you're not able to solve problems together and not have that conflict, you're finished. So for me, with the experience of looking back, that's what matters to me. Resource allocation and, and protecting it is a very big deal. Lucy. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the bootstrapping um, conversation because that's also our story. So we, we were bootstrapped for the first two years. And I think you have, again, to go back to the objectives and what you want from this from the very beginning. Because if you go bootstrapped, you could have the experience. Um, you, you, I mean, everybody has a different experience. So you can't say it's going to be this way or that way. But for us, for example, I can see that it also can create some issues with investment let's say if you want to do a bigger race but you haven't got the, the the history of having investors or VCs on your cap table at the beginning of the journey then you almost are in between you are too much for a, ser for a seed you're not enough for a series a and investors are a little bit um, confused i think the investors are very much looking for like traditional structures things that follow the rules like you are a founder or co-founder, you can't be married co-founders. Um, you, you know, everything has to be like as, as in the books. And if you're a little bit different to that, that could cause some issues. So I think it's, it's understanding that, okay, if I go down this route, this in, you have to anticipate and understand this could then block me from something else three years um, later, four years, five years later. So trying to think not just now, whatever I do and then I'll figure out later. There is also, I think, an impact on what you do today in the, in the next few years. So thinking about that quite carefully and thinking on what's important to you and, and your objectives. I think, I mean, it's interesting actually. So um, the, the, what you're describing, because what, what all of you are describing is those, um, is, is how to, th those early stages of finding and, and, and really validating and then, and then committing to something that you just have no sense of where it's going, right? You don't really know how it could, where the destination is. You kind of have an idea of where it could be, but you don't know. And sometimes when you've had that experience, you're a bit more calculated about just understanding what to do in, in certain situations, right? Because you know, you've, you've, you've seen it once before, at least or at least once before, if not multiple times when you're living in this world. Because one of the other things I think I've learned over the last four years is that um, when you start a, a company, um, any sort of company, whenever you meet someone else who's also started anything, like whether it's a charity or a company or anything, you kind of have this, it's, it's like, I don't know what it is, but you have this weird affinity to like end up talking to them for like the whole afternoon at some, at your kids, at your kids, like kind of like some party that you've gone to, right? And that has actually happened to me multiple times, right? You go to like a friend's like barbecue or something, and there's someone there who started something from scratch and um, um, whether it's a charity or you know anything like they've started something and you suddenly just have realized like my wife comes up to me and was like you know you've been like talking like you you haven't spoken to your children for the last three hours right and, and you're like you're like in the zone right you're literally like, like you found you found a member of your tribe that you've never met before yeah you know? suddenly then, part, I'm part of a tribe it's a universal kind of feeling I got yeah, yeah. 
and and you you do that, and it isn't, and sometimes it's like people that have nothing to. I mean, they're not in, they're not clinicians, they're not necessarily in. You know, they just they uh, they. For, for me, it's that they there's this weird thing where you end up talking about certain things, which my wife is sitting there and asking like, what are you guys like? Honestly, how interesting is that that you're talking about? I mean, that that isn't something that's worth talking about, right? And yet you get into this conversation, and I guess that's the the interesting like kind of the addictive nature of this early stage right because you you find that all those problems are so unsolvable and yet you have to somehow navigate through them um and i find that whether it, both with the hla and with medics academy i found that the same has been true for both right that with the, with the not-for-profit it's a completely it's not the same in terms of you need to find resources like money as much i mean we do still need resources but you don't actually need money as much for that but you do need resources you need people right you need basically people to spend time on the idea because if you don't have that you, you can't do everything yourself and as the as something blows up in front of you you basically need to just plug every hole going because otherwise you don't want to like for for the hla it's all about the experience of these young clinicians right and you want that experience to be perfect that's your like your driving like my driving like for the team it's the driving thing is that this experience for these young clinicians has to be really good has to be interesting has to be like something they want to do and when it falls apart you're just you know you feel this deep sense of like irritation that you haven't plugged that hole because every other hole you've got your finger in um and i think and, I, and i'm seeing the same thing on the on medics academy which is exactly the same thing but in a different way because it's all finance right like i actually have to find the resources to plug those holes um but at the same time the what i've noticed is that both have become passion driven like so the teams in both whether it's finance driven or it's not finance driven actually the teams have ended up being as passionate about the about the the collective problem as each other they i cannot claim that somehow in the social enterprise they are somehow more passion driven because the guys in the in the in the profit company they don't you know it's all about they have this mission they want to hit and they desperately want to hit it and they want to make it work and so so they like drive forward for that and I guess that moves me on to the thing that um, that was raised already. That uh, I, I can't remember. I think it was Anas that raised it about co-founders, right? Who, you, how you find this these these early members of your tribe? And I guess it would be interesting to hear some of the experiences because, like Alex and I mean Alex and Hassan, although you're you you're not currently working in that format, you've obviously had co-founders before in your previous projects. Owain, I think you you're a you're a solo founder, aren't you? So like, what is? And I, I'm I'm coming to you, Lucy, because I definitely want to address like to kind of talk a bit talk to you about the like your founder relationship thing. But but Owain, how how did you make the decision to kind of do it on your on your own? You're on mute, Owen. <laughs> so I would say I'm, def I'm definitely not on my own, uh, and I haven't done it on my own uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So sure, you know, I, I kind of started uh, Synapses and and you know funded it to to start with and and built the team. But you know, one of the first people I recruited was our CTO. So that and he's a guy I've known now for nearly ten years, and I've worked with him before, and he's been with us from from the beginning. Um, and, you know, so he is like Anna says, you need somebody, um, you know, like you need somebody, you know, so one, he is incredibly competent, you know, he, he's, I'm just always in awe of, of his, um, capability and his intellect. And I'm like, he just humbles me all the time when I, you know, suggest a way forward and he, you know, comes back with, the, with, um, his, 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 his suggestions. But it's just, it's, I just love working with him. You know, I've spent, I don't know how many hours, you know, you know days just working uh, on, on a product. And just that, just, I just love doing that. Um, and that, that is just such a joy and that sustains me. Um, and then the, the next person uh, who, who joined uh, was, was Angus. Um, and, you know, he, he is somebody who I really trust. He's such um, a a solid person, and you know he's been through kind of the battles with me. Like we always think of ourselves with with our you know those old sand um, you know helmets that that is what they call. Uh, I can't remember what they're called, but the, those sandy hats that soldiers have when they're in the desert. We think of ourselves like that, like in a battle. Um, and he you know he's just such a stable person and. You need that because it's it's really tough running a company for several years, 
um, and and battling it's just very tough. So you need somebody who 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 you know, or more than one person who who is going to be with you through that period, and people you respect and and you, you know you you trust. I think that's that's very important. So although I you know I, I started the company and and you know I've definitely haven't done it myself by any stretch yeah. of imagination. And then, I mean, just on the issues of, of like, because I think Alex raised the issues of like those little, like, you know, you, those niggles and stuff. What What is the, like, how do you identify that person that you're going to, I mean, I think Anna has summed it up like really well that you basically spend more time, I think, with your, with the people you work with than anyone else. So how do you, how do you make that decision? Because I think what I also see with a lot of people that come and talk to me about this stuff is that often they don't really have, they haven't spent an vast amount of time thinking through who that person they're going to be working with is they've they've almost kind of fallen into the into a into a situation where they've like they they started talking about an idea with someone and they it's kind of spiraled and now they've decided they're doing it so like if you had to rethink that finding that person what would you do what well, from my experience johan it's it's in many ways there are you know there, there, there needs to be a certain chemistry needs to be a certain shared vision. Um, but I think the best advice I got from a colleague of mine who's been through that experience actually out in Silicon Valley in, 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 in stateside is really having that honest conversation from day one of what are you looking for, what you're expecting, what you want to go for. And even start talking about what would you do when things go wrong. Um, and, and start planning for that, having that honest conversation. It's almost like you're writing prenuptials, even though you're hoping you never have to go down that route, because it's a marriage of some sort. It's a relationship that you're building, it's a partnership. Um, so you really start thinking about what are the roles and responsibilities? What are the expectations? What are the, where do you wanna go? Because even when things go, do go well, often if co-founders are not on the same page for their exit strategy, not on the same page for their fundraising, not on the same page for what they would like this to evolve, that's when problems happen. And of course, when things do go wrong, there's an obvious issue there. So I think whilst it's really important to get the right chemistry, um, the blend of personalities, the kind of yin and yang of the personalities, it's really important to ensure that you have those early conversations, which might feel a bit awkward, might feel a bit like kind of um, almost assuming the worst out of people or out of humanity, but 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 it's, it's, it really helps clear the air and keeps the minds and sharps in focus. The other thing I want to add before kind of moving on from the founding team. So whilst I, I had a co-founder, I think I'm also, you know, to add to what, what, what Owen said earlier, um, it's really important to identify pretty much the first two or three years of your existence, the early employees who join you. And I often call them founder type personalities because whilst they're not officially co-founders, they weren't there from the founding of the business, they act and behave like co-founders in the way they care about the business, in their passion towards the business, in their ability to add to the vision of the business and help it evolve with the founding team. Um, and they're often you know, paid volunteers. They're of course coming in to join you on that journey and they're in many ways formally employees of the business, but, but um, that is almost your secret weapon that makes you stand out and able to, 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 to win against the odds, especially when you have competitive market full of laggards and incumbents with probably deeper pockets and bigger teams than you. Um, the only way uh, uh, David can beat the Goliath in that, in that kind of scenario is with your team and, and, and that kind of founding type personalities who will go above and beyond, who, who can flex and who can understand, you know, how, who, who are able to deliver um, amazing outcome and output with very little resources and be able to really be there for the whole marathon, not just a sprint. Um, so I, again, you know, whilst obviously I, you know, it's, it's not a hundred percent of your team will be that way. It's, 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 it's not going to always be that rosy, uh, but you need to have enough of that in your company, enough of that in your team um, throughout your journey to really help uh, make up for the fact that you are an SME, you are working against the odds. Um, you are, climbing a mountain um, and, and, and every law of physics dictates that you should fail, yet you don't. And the only reason you don't is because of that team that you built around you. Okay, and um, 
I mean, I guess that leads nicely on to Lucy and uh, and like because you, you you've got a, 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 a something that is relatively rare in the in the tech startup side, mm -hmm. but often you do see in lots of the other in other organisations, you know, family businesses and and mm -hmm. also. Um, in charities and stuff where where it's uh, you, the relationships are often much like m very different from in tech where <laughs> actually finding starting with someone you're related to or you're married to or whatever is not um is not um is not seen as the normal thing but but lucy tell us about how you know i'm not not you don't have to go into any any uh any, any painful details but but how how do you, you're married to your co-founder how, how does that work no but as you rightly said uh, people often um they often attach um, husband and wife to family business. So sometimes they have a difficulty understanding that you can both be very ambitious, you can both be all in, and there is not like the wife and then there is the whole gender issue that's coming on top of it, which is a real one. Um, so people dissociating you as founders and as husband and wife and all of that, um, it creates a bit of mess in people's head because it's not normality. And so anything that is a bit um, different is, you know, um, scary sometimes for people like investors or things like that. We've heard many times um, you have everything that we're looking for, but uh, husband and wife is a big red flag, um, which I still really struggle to understand. But we've gone into very painful conversations, very personal conversations. Um, so I think that's why I said you have to really um, make decisions into like what's your objective, what is important to you for me. Um, destroying my marriage for this because I work with investors or people that want to put us apart and so on. That that's not something I'm interested in. So I think in our case, it's I don't dissociate my work and my life because we are constantly working. We're very passionate. We love what we're doing. So actually, being married is a is a strength because we go to conferences around the world together. We are always together. As as you guys said, you are always working with your co-founder and. I think it's a chance to be able to work with your um, with your spouse because in the end you spend the time with them. Obviously, it's not going to be only like um, a lovely time because it's going to be challenging and difficult. But at the same time, because you you have the same mission in life. Obviously, if you got married, generally you would have the same vision and mission, and you would want the same things in life. So in the end, it's much easier, in my opinion, to make decisions together and and to come to. Um, to agreeing on things. Um, we have very separate um, sets of skills and personalities, and that really complements, um, I think, the, the, the team. And then it's not something like, oh, you're working with your spouse or how, you know, I should, you should never go into business with family and so on. It can create issues and so on, but it's not something we went in just like that out of the blue. We've been working together for seven years now. We, it's our third business together. So it's not something we have just like gone out of the blue like that. We bought, we, we had a traditional business, which we sold. We had a online kind of uh, consultancy business, uh, which went well. And then we decided to stop that to really focus on um, our uh, startup. So that's a decision we made together. And I think um, you shouldn't be scared um, to do that because it's not in the codes or it's going to be seen at this or that. Um, I think I have been very silent about it. In fact, I have written um, some notes and some articles that I would like to put out there one day, but for now, maybe it's not the time, but I'm, I'm happy I'm, I have the, op the the chance to actually say something about it because, yeah, it's... A, yeah. it's it, it's, it's interesting though, isn't it, Lucy? Because I, I mean, I, I don't know what others think, but like family business is, is a very, is, is a much older, like more trodden path than than the current you know uh, startup uh, like you know the the startup world has these kind of mantras and these fixations on certain types mm -hmm. of things and yet the model you're describing of the family run business is actually like you know like literally is there has been there for you know decades generations that are like hundreds of years where people have started businesses often with the people they trust the most because understanding these relationships is so difficult it's the only difference last... here uh johan is that you have investors so you yeah. are into a family with an investor the investor they don't want to compete against two people who are very solid together they want to compete with one person and take as much as they can from that person so that's the main difference from a family traditional business to a startup business 
And that's why it's causing an issue. After thinking about it a lot, I think that's the conclusion I came to. That's really, I mean, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think, uh, Anna, so do, uh, what, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, be, I was just going to say, I think, I think there's something, um, I think it's also cultural. Um, from my understanding, um, most German corporations historically in Germany are actually family owned businesses on generations and multiple generations. And most of the big brand car companies are still part owned by generation. Most um, uh, tech businesses in the past 50 years, um, especially the SMEs to mid size um, are not even listed in the stock market. They're still owned by the same families and, and managed by couples and their kids and their grandkids and their cousins. And, and so it's not just really the old, old world. Even many G8 countries or G7 countries um, have big chunks of the economy managed by business. So I think it's, it might be a, a cultural thing that is not as common in the UK. Um, it's not a UK thing. It's also in German countries. Many German countries have actually said the same thing. So it's everywhere. Really? We've Interesting. Spoken so so spoken. you're saying that you found, you found that even investors from Germany had concerns yes. over... Germany, Switzerland, um, actually, they were probably the first ones to say that. And because they are upfront and they okay. are uh, straightforward and they tell you, which I really appreciate, but there are many who don't tell you and you still don't understand. Um, and then it's other people who tell you, oh, we have been... Um, told that this was a big red flag for you guys like what you're doing is Fantastic. awesome you have the economics this is this is this but you know there is always a but and the but often has been the the, the married thing which is you know and i guess that's interesting right because right. i guess the thing that that tells me or to, to, like listening to the this this the, the the kind of discussion it tells me is that if for, an organ for a person who has that idea that wants to take that forward in health, whether that's in health or anywhere else, um, if their motivation is like to start something that is purely just for the sake, you know, you want to start a business because you want to make uh, a profitable business and scale it using the traditional route, you want to look as traditional as possible, right? No matter what anyone says, you know, the fact is that what tech seems to love is is two people, usually kind of a similar, like either the same gender or com complementing, who aren't really connected to each other. They they raise a certain amount of money at this point. They raise another amount of money at this point. They do it in this certain, this sort of way. They've had this kind of background. You know, someone has is technical, someone's not. But actually, what you're what you know this discussion is kind of bringing out to me is that most people want like i think most people that don't aren't just going for that route they, they want to and especially in health i see this a lot people passionately want to do something that is genuinely about spending my life making a valuable contribution to the world right i want to spend my life like the reason i'm going into health and i'm not doing say direct to consumer i'm selling on amazon or something like that is that i actually like i want to spend my life doing something that genuinely makes a difference and i happen to also want to do it in this way because it gives me control so in that sense the like in health, it, like having those deeper connections really helps, right? Because I, I'm guessing what I'm listening to is that um, what even what, you know what Anas is saying is that he feels really like as as connected as possible to his co-founder. But what you're what what I'm you know what you've described is this connection, this team that is so tight and strong that no matter what is thrown at them, it will stay stay strong. Is so vital to the success story of that in entity. That whether it, and that actually whatever model you go for, whether you go for a charity, or whatever, you need to be really, really tightly connected in order to make it successful, because that is probably what's going to drive the success more than anything. Hassan, um, I would say perhaps controversially that you can have founders who are not close together as long as they are driven by the same mission. Okay. So if you have a mission that drives you, you will have conflict inevitably, married co-founders or not. And, and when you have that conflict, what brings you together is you have your own interests, you have a team together, but you've got a mission. And, and that, that's what drives us, right? So sometimes, and, and I know I've said the idea is less important than the team, but the idea of what you do and how you do it is different to a mission, right? My mission could be, for example, to make sure that medical education and training is given to people in, um, in Southern Africa, for example. That's my idea. How I decide to do it could change. I could pivot on that idea repeatedly. And why it could change is because 
we've got some people on board who are really good with tech. And actually we should be doing it more with tech, right? As an example. And, and you're gonna have the conflict with your co-founder about the idea. You're gonna have the conflict with the co-founder about the execution. You're gonna have a, a conflict about how much noise they make when they eat, right? Because you're gonna get cabin fever because the amount of time you spend with your co-founders is ridiculous. And that's also because you're gonna travel with them. You're gonna live with them, work with them, do business with them, travel with them. It, you're intertwined. And therefore you need the mission. And that's the key. Um, I'm gonna, I, I, I've, I've chaired this terribly, right? Cause I had a series of bullet points, which I shared with you guys. And I, I promised you uh, that we would get, we would like get through this and also we would do it in a timely manner, but I'm gonna try and um, just uh, pick off a couple of other things, which I wanted to, wanted to talk about. And I'm going to indulge, uh, I know Lucy, you've like, we, yeah, well, all of you have taken your time out, but Lucy's on, on holiday and has actually called in on a pro holiday, which is like incredible. And I know it's the first one you've had in like seven years. So that's, uh, that's the other thing that shows that literally your, uh, your, 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 the level of commitment you guys have, but the, um, is the issue of country, right? And I want to talk about this because it is one thing that is maybe, and I don't think it's necessarily just a business one. It is also the kind of lifestyle, the wider issues, the barriers, all of that stuff, right? So where you, like one of the things I've seen in, in both, um, in both actually the startup, the tech startup, but also in the social enterprise, is that the space that you go into like the the there are differences about doing the same idea in different countries and in some countries it is much easier to move things forward and in other countries it's really difficult to like you're literally like going against the grain to do something and i've certainly seen that in the uk where like the health space is like so hard to innovate in because everyone seems to be like kind of like you know very suspicious of everyone else in the space in some of the experiences we've had outside of the uk have been like crazy phenomenal like in terms of just the willingness to do things because people are like they get it they they get a certain type of activity and they're like desperate for you to help them do to solve that problem and i just wonder what what other people's reflections are on that first stage because I wonder in myself, I, I'm very rooted to the UK. I love that, you know, my family here, my, I've, I've grown up here. Um, but I know that doing what I'm doing would have been so much easier if I didn't do it here, right? I'd have, it would have been much easier if I'd gone and did it somewhere else. And I, you know, we all know the stories about people that have like on their second startup, they've literally gone and uh, set up uh, in, a, in a different country as their first play at Port of Call. So what, what, what do you guys think about, about that? Because I guess that's the other thing with when you start getting into relationships and co-founders and family and all this stuff like where that that part of the issue comes in alex don't know whether you're or wayne do you want to so i mean i guess i guess so from a clinibee perspective it's about so that clinibee the the problem it answers in the uk um has different sort of uh, it answers the same it answers the same problem in the uk as it does in the states for example but what makes people buy the product has two entirely different um, there's two entirely different reasons why an organization would buy the product and one is more long-term than the other. So for example, our, our core is in the UK, but we'd obviously like to move to, 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 to sell into other countries as well. But the States will be some, is, a, is our, you know, a real stated aim, but that's a much longer term because in the UK, it's about saving time, saving some money. Um, and that's what really makes people purchase the, the product is it, it kind of reduces their governance overheads and it reduces the amount of time clinicians are having to spend um, doing this kind of stuff. In the States, it's all about risk mitigation. So if you can prove that you can reduce litigation by using this product, they'll buy your product. But that's a much longer term play. So in terms of countries, the, the way that we're operating is so I've started developing relationships with insurance companies in the States because they're the people that get you into these hospitals. It's not by going to a hospital and say, buy my product, they'll say, get out of here. But they're all insured and insurance companies all charge the same amount of money and insurance companies differentiate themselves by offering add-on services and tech companies are one example of doing that. But we're not ready, for example, to go into the States because we can't prove the risk. We can't prove that you will have less litigation by using our product. So it's a kind of a longer term play. It's lovely, I'd love to be able to do that, but we're just not ready. Um, so in terms of like where we base ourselves and where we 
spend all our time. We're just working on our core product in the UK and we're just letting out little feelers. And then when, when, when we, when we think we've got a product where that will bite, we'll move to a, we'll, we'll move country in, in effect, but it, it won't be the same reason people buy. And it did, there'll be different cultural reasons, different. There's a whole, a whole host of different issues. We've got NHS over in the UK, which have a different set of problems. And in the States, it's, you know, they're all private organizations and they'll have a different set of problems. So the problem is still apparent in both countries, but there'll be different purchasing decisions and we're not, you know, when we're ready, we'll go. But we'll put feelers out to begin with. Okay. Oh, uh, so, yeah, so I think you know, um, the UK has a lot of fundamental things that make it a great place to do business, you know. So uh, one is, you know, the rule of law, you know, uh, a lot of people from different countries speak English, so it's it's you know you can attract a lot of people to work with you. Um, you know, we traditionally had you know a lot of great talent come come and live here, study here. You know, a lot of people are, that work in our company um, have have come from from abroad, for example. You know, so uh, and and settled in 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 the UK. So that makes it really good and also you know it's 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 transparent in in, in many ways so you know the the rules of um recruitment for example are, are transparent and and they're clear and they're, they're 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 you know fundamentally fair so i think i think that's very good um also in the health service it's it's well financed really you know if you think about it compared to other services and and as you say if you've got a value proposition then you should find a market for it because people are hungry for an idea and then beyond that you know the governments uh, you know successive governments have um actively encouraged innovation in in this sector you know they, they've made it easier and easier and you know through academic health science networks and and the like they're, they're doing their best and to open it up and and to get in innovation and so all the things make, make the UK a very good, you know, an excellent place to start. And, and secondly, it's a great reference. So, you know, we're you know, starting to do business in, in, in the Middle East and, you know, the UK is, is a great reference for that. You know, they, they, they recognize that, that the rigor and, um, you know, the, the, the quality of the healthcare here. Um, so, yeah, so, I, you know, I haven't got much experience of, of the States or anything like that. So, but I, I can say, you know, trying to look objectively at, at what, what the UK has to offer. And I think it, it's, you know, it's got a very, a lot of, a lot of positives. Hmm. Okay. Anyone else want to, Anna? Just really, really briefly following up from everyone said, I, I think, I think I, I you know, really agree with Owen the fact that I think the UK has quite a lot of um, good ingredients for why you can start a business in the UK. Um, I completely agree. The talent actually in the UK is quite good. Um, and quite diverse. I think diversity is really important, bringing in um, diversity of opinions. I mean, we're a team of 38, um, and in our team, we've got 22, I think last tally was 22 different languages spoken in a team of 38. Uh, but, but, that's, but that's London for you. That's, that, as you know, in fact, more half of our team is not in London. So it's actually the UK's talent pool. Um, going back to the NHS, the NHS is, despite being... Um, quite challenging to work with in many ways, like any public sector organization, actually has gone through a very interesting decade to become a lot more accepting of SMEs and innovations and disruptive innovations. So I think a lot of us have probably some leftover feelings about the NHS that might have um, been outdated a little bit. But I think the most important practicality, ahead of great talent, business environment, and NHS that is willing to adopt innovation, the most important thing is where you are comfortable to work and what you know about. So someone can tell me the American model or um, the French model healthcare system is easier to work with. Well, I don't know these systems. I've worked in the NHS. I've been trained in the NHS. I understand the NHS. I understand the problems of the NHS. I understand the psychology of the buyer in the NHS with the good and the bad that comes with that. I know how to tackle that. Um, it could be easier elsewhere, but I don't know that. And I, there will be a lot more unknown unknowns there. When I get to the point of scale-ups, there are people out there like Hassan who we can speak to and help us understand what to explore outside of the UK. Um, but really fundamentally, it's where your comfort zone in, um, where can you tackle the problem, where are your connections, and the people you know you can draw resources from, draw expertise from. And if that's 
where you've been, you know, where you lived most of your career and then developed most of your skills and relationships is in the UK, then that's the answer for you there. Brilliant. And I think I think that's uh, so. Um, we're going to uh, I'm I'm going to ask one. There's going to a couple of last questions, but I think it was I, it's really in this three kind of series arc um a three episode arc i wanted to really get back to that first the first thing we talked about which was around the internationalization agenda because so many people do are now starting to ask questions about like you know the internationalization where should like what can you do and, and there are so many options now available to people and i think actually this you know you you guys have totally hit it hit the nail on the head which is that the um the 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 system we know whatever the foibles are of it it's like it's absolutely um, um, it is the place that you find the most comfort and, and neutralizing those, um, the unknowns is so important. So when people, I think it comes back to the general ideas of when you start something is that you want to neutralize as many unknowns as possible so that you can then at least have a chance, the best chance of succeeding. So it, it's, 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 it's great to hear that. Um, we've got one question which, I, which has come through, which is uh, basically how did you find your co-founder um, and, and so that's a classic question I hear every time we have like a, a tech, um, a tech kind of uh, whatever I see a tech speakers that they often, I've heard that question before. So I don't know whether anyone would want to do a quick brief answer and then I'm going to wrap up on that one. So uh, does anyone want to jump in on that one? Yeah. I, I can I could just say that my, the co-founder I work with is um, an ICU consultant, um, but I've, I've actually known him for about 10 years already. And I he's as bolsy as I am. So I knew we'd work really well together um but yeah so that, that that's how it came about we both discussed the problem and we both talked about it for a long period of time and validated it um with his organization so you know that's that's how i met Hassan? um so very quickly i had two very good friends of mine who were also in the nhs uh, one deeply in technology one deeply in data um, and together the three of us we all felt that there was a glass ceiling we felt in informatics and in health tech, we were never going to be able to get those successes that we would have liked to. So we made a difficult decision to step outside of the NHS to form a company. And I mentioned pivots. Our first pivot was to move away from selling to the NHS to selling to the drug industry, to Big Pharma, to support them to talk to the NHS about value and outcomes using NHS data. We wouldn't give them the NHS data. We'd say, no, we'll do the analysis. We'll tell you the result but we were effectively gamekeeper turned poacher. And the reason why we got together is because we had a shared sense of mission. We were each of us ambitious. We all wanted to do the right thing, but we knew that we weren't gonna make it where we were. And that, that bonded us together. And, and I tell you, it's not about winning. It's about never losing. When you've got that mentality, now we're not gonna lose. That's what binds you. So you've got to find that chemistry. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Lucy, you want to? Last thing, Clint. Yeah? Yeah, I wanted to say for anyone out there who is thinking to start, like, whether a small business, uh, a project, a blog, a startup, whatever, like, don't try to not compare yourself with what you see out there in magazines, for example, TechCrunch or things like that, because you will see this person um, is the most successful because they have raised 8 million, 10 million, 20 million, all these millions, but it doesn't mean they necessarily have any revenue. So you may actually have a better solution than them. Think that what you are building is unique. No one else is building that. You have a different audience that you serve. Um, you, for example, for us, we have a lot of competition now. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult, you know, to think, but if you start comparing yourself, you're going to really struggle because I think that that can really create some um, confidence issues or some thinking, oh my God, I need to be there, I need to be, but it's, it's completely different. Every company is different. Um, you may be collecting data that they are not collecting, which could be useful for you for your own exit. Um, you could be building different relationships that they are not building. So it's all about your unique execution, your unique audience, and not trying to compare yourself um with what what else is out there and what is also on magazines which doesn't always reflect on the reality so i think if you have other founders out there in your network other business owners um friends just talk to them because they will tell you actually the truth and they will actually it's like TechCrunch. it's like instagram you know there is instagram versus reality 
it's not like that. So I think you can also speak to like incubators, accelerators, or other um, association related to what you are doing. Um, and you can also reach out to founders, um, like on LinkedIn, for instance, if someone reached out to me, I love talking, sharing my opinion, whatever. So I would be delighted to talk to someone and, and tell, you know, the actual reality of what I am going through rather than paint something that, you know, creates some um, complex for people, I think. Cool. Um, any, any final views, Hassan? A very quick comment. Um, this is a very big topic and I know that we've not covered it. So there's a, a book that I really love on the topic called Good to Great by Jim Collins, quite famous book. He analyzed more than 1400 companies uh, and their results over 40 years. And he looked at the ones that were good and then they became great. And he picked them out and he studied them in depth and then found out what they had in common. And the book goes through those factors. And I think it's essential reading for those who want to be in business because you can jump ahead of that. You don't have to be good and then try to become great. Learn those lessons. And one of those key lessons is really what I focused on today. Get the right people on the bus. Forget about the direction. Get the right people on the bus. Get the wrong people off the bus. You'll be fine. I think that's a great place to, to end because actually I think the lesson I was, uh, the, what, the thing I wanted to draw out today was very much about um, no matter what type of entity you're going to go and create, it's, it's what are the common lessons that we can learn from this space because I'm seeing some incredibly smart and talented people, you guys and lots of other people who are going into this space, who are like innovating like their organizations and creating innovative organizations, but those organizations could sit in any other space. And a lot of what we're trying to, to, to focus on with young uh, or with early stage clinicians about when they're thinking about that innovative leadership journey is in the innovation part, like what are the common lessons they need to learn? And I, and I, I guess in an entrepreneurship model, it's that the lesson I'm drawing from what you're talking about, what you guys are talking about, is that often even when you're innovating inside an organization, you want to find those that team, those connections, those individuals that you can really connect with because if you're going to drive forward really successful projects, even within an organization, you're going to end up picking people you're going to spend the rest of your kind of careers with often, right? So I, the, the, the lesson, the, con the comparator I would think about in the NHS is when you go and join a department, if you, when you become a consultant or a GP or, uh, or a, in any of the allied health professions, you often are picking somewhere that where you're going to spend potentially at least nowadays, maybe less, but at least a decade, but you could be picking somewhere you're going to spend the rest of your career, 25, 30 years. And it's, it's almost like you're joining that group of people that you're going to spend the rest of your lives with. And I watched in the departments, I'm sure that, that all of you have seen this in some of the clinician clinical departments I've worked in where like, if I was be if I was looking and giving outside advice, I'd be like, "Are you sure you want to pick this department to work with? You know, are these sure these are the people you want to spend the next twenty five years of your life with?" And I guess that's the same kind of relationship issues that we've talked about. Like when you're finding that team, and and I guess the only thing, the only difference is that when you're in the position that many of us are in, many of you are in, you get to pick somewhat that team. Like there's some aspect of, of picking which gets you get to have but I guess in lots of other places you don't so but the, the lessons and the relationships and the importance of the importance that the, the way that success happens I think is is often the same that was my final reflection was um, I'm going to um, I'm going to just uh, wrap up by saying that next week we're we're going to move off uh, the innovation and entrepreneurship space and we're going to talk uh, we're going to the, uh, we're going to be talking um, about uh, respect uh, respect and, and bullying and harassment so the episode is going to be co-hosted with Respect and Powers, which is an organisation that the uh, that was a HLA project for two of our scholars, uh, Geith Silva and Jessica Prince, and we will be discussing uh, the issues around um, around bullying and harassment in healthcare, but also how that impacts on um, on on delivering excellent care or good, delivering good care within the NHS. So we've got an incredible lineup of speakers. I'm, I mean, genuinely have a look at this. It 
it is an incredible lineup of speakers from across the NHS and across um, staff groups. And they we will be raising awareness of positive initiatives aimed at empowering uh, healthcare professionals. Um, the event will be chaired by uh, Dr. Brenda Kelly, who's a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology and fetal med maternal medicine um, from Oxford University. And we have a list of, uh, of people that I'm sure many of you will have heard of before. So uh, si Simon Fleming, Morvia Gooden, uh, Megan Reitz, Chris Turner, uh, Justin Varney, Christina Kostach, and uh, Ran Timmy Ayodele. So we have got a really good lineup for next week. So just uh, do check in. And then the week after, we're going to be uh, talking about climate change and the impact on the NHS. And for the whole of September, the schedule is starting to really come together. Uh, for August and September, the schedule is really coming together. We will be coming back to innovation um, probably in early September when uh, we hope to be joined by uh, Ben Marapathu, who's talking about social care. Um, and then there'll, there'll probably be a bit of a panel on that, on, on, on social issues. But there's a, a full, uh, honestly, have a look at the, what's coming up over the next few uh, months because we've got some incredible uh, speakers awaiting waiting uh, waiting, uh, waiting to, uh, to talk to you so thank you all very much for your time thank you for taking uh, uh, taking an interest in in HLA live and for following this and I'm really grateful to our speakers um, all the ones that have, are with us today as well as Elliot who was also in the in the first panel so thank you to Hassan to Owain to Alex to Anas and to Lucy um, who have been like just shared such great pearls of wisdom with you all um, and to Pedro and the team for basically helping put out HLA Live. So I will, uh, I'll see you all next week um, and thank you again.